Hello, and welcome to Horror Rewind. This is Kelly Florence. And I'm Meg Hofdahl, and I'm back! <laughs> Yay! And this week, we're talking about To Death Becomes Her. Now, this is a first, and possibly an only. We are recording in Springfield, Missouri. Meg, did you ever think I would say those words? No, I, I really didn't. This is, this is a, a really a high moment in, in Horror Rewind history. We are recording on location in Missouri. <laughs> if you, if we have Missouri listeners out there, tell us about Missouri and Springfield because we don't know much about it. We happen to have a layover here, and so we're going to record while we're at our layover. But uh, we've just driven through it, like Meg and I, so we don't really know much about Missouri. No, I, my only experience is um, going to see like the Mark Twain stuff. Um, which was actually really cool in Hannibal. But we're sitting in Springfield right now. It's a gray, gloomy day. We're looking out the windows of the airport, and um, we don't see much. There's not much here at the airport to see. But that's why we're doing this right now. Yay! So we hope that you are well, Horror Rewind listeners, and uh, you're having a good day wherever you are, and that it's not gray and gloomy. So, Meg, since we talked last, your book has come out, and... You've been busy promoting. Do you want to tell us a little bit about that? Sure. I won't talk too much about it because I'm sure everyone's <laughs> tired of hearing about it. But, um, yes, I've been busy promoting. I've been getting word out. Um, we just went to a con, and we've got more conventions to do this spring and summer. So um, it's really fun. I, this is a fun part of my job because a big part of it is sitting in my pajamas writing, which is really cool. But it's also fun to go out and actually um, – sort of see the world and I love going to conventions and the people watching yesterday was amazing yeah I I love cosplayers I am not skilled in creating costumes or sewing or anything so I admire it so much I think I admire things even more when I when I know I could never do it yeah well and more than that I mean I I feel like I'm a pretty confident person but like you have to be a certain have a certain confidence to really commit to some of that cosplay. And I don't, I don't know if I'm there, you know? Yeah, exactly. There, there definitely is a confidence that I don't possess for, for some of that. Now, it's April. It's the first week of April. And coming up at the end of this month, we discovered that there's a Riverdale convention in Chicago. And we're going to try to go. But speaking of that, we discovered Riverdale last night. So we were like in a really dark place of Netflix where you don't know what you're going to watch next. You spent way too much time searching for something to watch. And we were like, I, I, actually it was you. You were like, what about Riverdale? And I'm like, somebody told me that we should watch it. And then we started watching it and it was like, oh my God. It was like, where has this been all my life? It is so amazing. So if you're familiar with the Archie comics, the comic books, with Archie and Betty and Veronica and Jughead and Moose and everybody. They have updated it, and it's a, a show on the CW, but it's darker, and there's murder in it, and it is so clever, and uh, I just love it. It's cast so well, and everyone's so hot, and it's it's also fun if you read the comics to just be like, oh, it's so-and-so, and oh, you know, and then it has this, like, great nostalgic flair and the visuals it's just so beautiful and yeah it, it that was like highlight so yes we have a new show to watch which is always amazing and fun if you are really liking something tweet us um, comment on facebook or wherever and let us know because we're always looking for recommendations so death becomes her is the movie this week and meg do you want to tell us a little background about it before we start talking about it Sure. Well, first I'll talk about my personal experience with it. We, our family, did not go to the movie theater much. We watched a lot of movies, but we didn't go to the movie theater very much. Um, and so this is one of the rare occasions where my whole family, me, my brother, my mom, dad, all went to the movie theater. So it really sticks out in my mind. And um, I... I don't know. It was just one of those experiences where I think it was one of the first times, too, I actually got to see a, a movie in the theater that had anything of a horror element because this movie came out when I was eight. Um, and and the other memory I have is my dad, um, before the movie started, he 
went and got us popcorn and he sp- and when he came to sat down he literally spilled every every kernel of popcorn <laughs> across the floor and pop went everywhere and it was a disaster and my dad was just like so angry so i that that sticks in my mind is like that that's that's what happened at the uh, theater so classic dad move but um anyway so I, I sort of, I very much, this movie is very close to my heart because not only did I see it in the theater and it was that experience, but I ended up probably watching it a hundred times um, as a kid. So it came out in 1992. It's directed by Robert Zemeckis and um, it's starring Goldie Hawn, Bruce Willis, Meryl Streep. Um, I mean, you can tell it has a, a big budget. Um, something that I thought was really interesting is. Um, it is the first movie to, well, first of all, it's obviously very, uh, computer generated effects heavy, but it's, uh, the first movie to use, um, a pioneering direction of industrial light and magic. And it was the second movie was Jurassic Park. So they used, um, the tech from this and then improved upon it the next year in Jurassic Park. And they had the same cinematographer, same production designer and stuff. So um, I thought that was kind of cool. Although I wanted to share this quote. I found this is um, Meryl Streep. Um, she did not enjoy working on this movie because of the technology. Um, she said that it it was like being at the dentist, she said, um, because basically it was just standing around waiting for people to adjust things, and it was hard to act because she had to act to, um, you know, a lamp shade instead of Goldie Hawn. So, I thought that was kind of interesting. So yeah, that's kind of the background of the movie. Uh, I'd love to know what you think. I, we've never like talked about this movie or anything, so I know. So this is crazy because I sort of forgot about this movie. I rented it from the library it wasn't at my video my local video store it was at the library and I rented it and I freaking love this movie but I have no idea why it fell off the face of the earth for me because holy crap watching it again I'm like this is one of my favorite movies Mm -hmm. from my childhood holy crap and also when I so when I was re-watching it I'm like okay now I can re-watch it from this lens of present day and at first I was like oh they're pitting women against each other But then I realized they were making fun of pitting women against each other. What do you think? Yeah, I I think that it's easy to be like, well, they're they're putting women in this situation where they're they're really vain and they're pitting um, them against each other. But it turns itself on on its head several times because the joke about the vanity is funny because obviously this movie is being made in Hollywood where like. Um, that's, that is the name of the game. And that is what, I mean, it's, I think saying more about the extreme nature of Hollywood rather than these women and they are pit against each other, but then they become friends. Like, and that is what I loved. But looking back, yeah, of course there are things about it where it's like, Oh, you know, I wish, but okay. So this is something I wanted to talk about. And this is perfect because this movie is a, is a great sort of segue into it. I, I was like, I really want to talk about this on the podcast because when it was Women in Horror Month recently in February, there was a lot of attention made to women who kick ass and strong women and women who, you know, kick down doors and all this. And that's all well and good. But as someone who is making horror content about women, I think what we forget is that women need to be represented as complicated, um, not perfect. Um, they have flaws just as bad as men and that they're still redeemable and that they still can, um, come out the other side and have learned something. And, um, I feel like there are too few movies that star two women who are as complicated and as flawed as these women, but I, and you could argue that they're treated, um, I don't know, sort of like that they're, that we shouldn't take them seriously, but I don't think so at all. I actually felt like they actually grew in the movie. Um, I have some problems with some things at the end, but anyway, what do you think about this idea that, you know, we're not searching necessarily for strong women. It's about, you know, all colors of the rainbow. Well, and, and I think, that is 100% true. And also the word strong, it doesn't mean physical strength, as some people will take it literally. But 
just you can be strong in different ways and they have this role reversal in it and and also just be even if you're not physically strong or emotionally strong or if you mess up your entire life and make mistakes i want to see that on screen too you know it doesn't it doesn't have to be perfect people just all people and it feels like, and, and I think this is what we're searching for, is it feels like men in these situations, and in this movie, it, it does happen. Let's not forget that Bruce Willis in this movie murders his wife, but he gets to have the life he wants um, at the end of this movie. He, he, he's sort of treated like a saint, which they kind of make fun of, again, so there's always that sort of next level. Um, but women, oftentimes, if they aren't saints, they don't get the same happy ending you know and so what what we're searching for is women that are complicated and interesting and these women are are vain and um they care about money too much and image too much but you know what that doesn't mean that they're like throwaway that doesn't mean that they should be treated like not a decent character to follow through you know you wonder it's sort of like that breaking bad effect it's like would a a woman be able to be in that role and people would be able to, you know, have the empathy that they do for Walt. I mean, you know. Well, and it's kind of like when people were turning against Skylar because all of a sudden it's like, well, she's being a bee to, to Walt. It's like um, he is literally murdering, murdering people and is a meth dealer, yet they're giving the woman a hard time because she's saying this isn't okay, you know? So, yeah. Okay, speaking of Bruce Willis, he is, he was a big movie star then, but he's not portrayed in um, any sort of light that makes him handsome or charming or anything, which is good because they just make fun of him the entire time. I feel like they're not giving him enough credit for what he is. Like, they're saying he's a glorified Undertaker, but I mean, Undertaker, I think that's a cool job. But anyway, my Bruce Willis story, I've probably shared it before, is that I loved him on Moonlighting when I was in second grade. (laughs) I mean, hey, he's cutie. Um, Yeah, this is this is probably like my first exposure to him. So like, I, I certainly as a child, I didn't like get that this is sort of off brand for him. But yeah, I I love in this movie that he's sort of frumpy and and they're both fighting over him in the beginning um and he's not even hot then or or you know but yeah he seems like he is this sweet guy and and obviously like i said though let's not forget he does murder his wife that seems like maybe that's a little forgotten but um i love i love well, okay, what do you think? I See, I look back at it and I'm like, I love the whole like Goldie Hawn like, getting depressed and she's big and she's like a cat lady. Is that problematic? Well, I thought it was funny. And I think, I think everything is done. I feel, it feels more like well-done satire than problematic um, commentary on, on women and, and their lives. I thought it was funny. And then also... All of a sudden, she looks great, and we don't know her secret. And then Meryl is approached, and it looks like Invasion of the Blood Farmers, (laughs) the place where she goes to get this procedure or whatever, or get this, where she usually has her procedure. And did you notice that doctor, like, has a facial tic? (laughs) That's really funny. It's like, but, oh, it's explained later, because he also is young, and things are falling apart. Um, Oh, at, at one point, I can't remember which one of them, they're in the limo with Bruce Willis, and they just say... Could you just not breathe? Because she's so annoyed at him. I love that. I feel like you've probably said that to your husband before. It sounds like marriage, yeah. <laughs> um, and then I love the re- the role reversal that that they go through. All of a sudden, Meryl, you know, was on top of the world, and now she's not. Oh, and the dance number. Like, how did I forget about that? Like the beginning opening dance number. Holy crap! I love it. Yeah, this is one of those movies where I watched it so many times as a kid that I was saying lines like with the actors because there's just again there's that feeling of when you've seen a movie enough times as a kid it becomes part of who you are rather than even if I watched a movie 50 times right now as an adult I don't think it would stick in my mind as much as it as it does from then so yeah the opening number I remember that oh my gosh so many things um what did you think about did you feel like the CGI like held up I know it wasn't perfect but I think it was still impressive especially for the time and, and I did read that about Industrial Light and Magic, and I was like, okay, that's why it is as decent as it is. 
I, I have a question for you. How do you feel about open caskets? I'm not a fan. I just, I'm, I'm, not, a, I'm not a fan of open caskets. I mean, just FYI for <laughs> when the day comes, please don't. So everyone, it's noted, and there's, you know, proof that we will have an open casket for you. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> you know, I know. I, I used to be like, oh, it's, I think it's good because it gives people closure and everything. But the thing I realized is, you know, I, uh, it's kind of disturbing. Yeah, they don't look great. And then I, we can find closure in other ways than seeing a dead body. Yeah, I'm, and, and maybe, like, for, like, the a very close personal family member, that's okay, but... And this is all just our own judgments. People do what you want. But yeah, I always get a little um, weirded out at open caskets. Um, there's so many, oh my God, there's so many great moments in this. And I love, I love when she go, falls on the stairs and she's dead. And how sassy she is and like his reaction. And they go to the hospital and the doctor has a heart attack. Like it's just, it's such a mess and wonderful. So I'm going to back up a little bit before that moment. There's another great line. Meryl goes to her boy toy who's living in like the carriage house and he's sleeping with another woman and, um, in, and he's like trying to make up a lie and she's like, Oh, come on, at least lie quickly. (laughs) She's just, it's just like out there. And then, okay. Goldie Hawn's shrine for revenge is legit disturbing. Do you remember that? Yeah, it's great. And I mean, it's so like single white female. And I just, I love, I love that they, she's so focused on it. She has this book party. Everything is to just piss off Meryl Street. But then eventually it's just like they realized that they had, they had these dumb things. And it was like, it was actually, it wasn't even dumb. It was actually like emotional reasons why like Meryl Streep felt like, like Goldie Hawn's family like stuck up their nose at her and like they actually like gave them like some heft to their like past and I love that eventually then it was just like everything was like actually we're best friends now and and that's that is what redeems any if there is anything in this movie that's problematic I feel like that redeems it all well I I think so too and like I said in the beginning of my notes I'm like oh no but then I I just it it switched for me Another question. Would you drink a potion to stop you from aging? No, because it it just, I, no. Because I don't, I wouldn't want to live forever if, I mean, can you imagine what that would really be like? And, like, I'm not in an industry. I do understand. I, I do understand why, like, actresses um, become fixated on these things. But I'm not in an industry where, you know, it matters if I have a wrinkle. Yeah. And I too, like Bruce Willis says it, like, he's like, well, what if I get bored or whatever? It's like, yeah, living forever, like a vampire or in, and never aging. It, it might sound appealing, but there's no way that that could possibly end well. And like, look at Isabella Rossellini, like, okay, in this movie, she's gorgeous, but she has to basically like stay in that house. I mean, wearing her like bead bra and nobody can see her because she's supposed to be dead or old by now. So, I mean, how is that even worth it? I, I can't remember exactly what happens. Maybe you'll remember. But I wrote down that the talk through of the murder plan between Bruce Willis and Goldie Hawn is so well done. D- is it like a little montage or? Yeah, they like show them doing it, you know, and it's it's really, yeah, it's cute. It's like the hypothetical. Yeah, it's it's really cute. I like it. Um, <laughs> um, there was a dream sequence and on the table for the autopsy, her brain was in a jar and it was lab- labeled abnormal. Did you notice that? <laughs> I didn't notice that, but that, yeah, I think that's during that talk that they're having. Yeah. So yeah, they're like, her brain is abnormal. Um, and then I was, I commented in the beginning, you know, they were saying Meryl looked old and then it was 14 years later and she was still still supposed to look old. And this movie is now 26 years later and she still looks great in real life. And it's so funny as I was watching it, because this is like the opposite of what you're supposed to say. But I was like, we're always so concerned about Meryl Streep's talent, but she's beautiful. Like she's gorgeous, but we're always talking about how talented she is. So yeah, she looks great. The other thing I noticed about this movie, did you notice how grand the houses and or sets were? Yes. The house. I'm going to look, I have this up on my phone right now. It's what it says. The Greystone Mansion was used, um, and let's see what else. 
But uh, anyway, no, they they had some grand sets, and I know, like when I was a kid, I wanted to live in that house. The you know you mentioned this already, but the fall down the stairs has to be one of the best moments on film. <laughs> and I realize he's murdering her, but because we know what happens, and it is a comedy. Um, I feel like I'm going to give it a pass. And then they set up the shot. So when he's on the phone, you can see her broken body in the background coming back to life. And it's so amazing. I think that's the best shot of the movie because um, you see her getting up. And I am I, I have no, like, I can imagine why this movie was sort of indelible in my memory because I bet that really stuck in my mind as an eight-year-old because there were not effects like that and you know before then really and so I can see why this movie stuck in my mind and and why I watched it so much again it's female driven it's horror but it has that comedy element but but that particular scene where he's talking on the phone and she gets up backward and it's just crazy and then the line and when she gets up and she realizes she's like my ass I can see my ass (laughs) yeah and then she's still she's still vain (laughs) oh okay so then then you talked about this scene already too but when they go to the doctor you know she they both realize she's dead and they're both freaking out and they're sharing a flask which is hilarious and then Meryl says after she's declared dead she's like well could be worse (laughs) yeah yeah she's so cool about it I just I want to be I want to be as cool as her you know they had um, more than one female doctor, like doctors played by women in this movie. There was one in the beginning of the movie, and then there was one um, when she, when Meryl has been moved. She's like, she's like sleeping, but she's dead, of course. And she's moved to the morgue, and Bruce Willis is like, the morgue, she'll be furious. I love that. That's one of my favorite lines. <laughs> uh, oh, right after that, when he's going down to the morgue, they show those nuns like floating down the hall. That's so creepy. It felt like Beetlejuice. Yeah, they have a couple creepy moments in this um, where they were at the funeral home too, where they like show, oh, and a door opens at the, um, like you were saying with Invasion of the Blood Farmer look. Um, there's so many like little creepy moments like that that I, I love in this movie. Cause you know, yes, of course, the movie isn't like super scary, but it has, you know, those little, those little things, little horror things. Bruce Willis then takes that she's not really dead as a sign that they're meant to be together. And Goldie Hawn is spying on them. And she, he thinks she's moving her dead body. But of course, she's, you know, well, she is dead, but, you know, technically not. Yeah. Oh, my God. Well, obviously, the stomach, um, the shotgun blasts the stomach. And then Meryl Streep's like, you shouldn't, honey, you shouldn't wear a two piece anytime soon. She says something like that. But oh, my God, that that's amazing. And the way they like use that. The effects of like oh my god everything I love it I love their outfits I love their sass I love that it's about women I love that Bruce Willis sort of became this like um sort of all he was to them was they just wanted him to be around to take care of their looks now this is when I slip into the thing I don't like and this this is like the new epidemic that I just keep noticing about everything is that this entire movie was about them, but who was the climax about? You know, it's like he stole the climax from them. Um, he it, the he got to hang from the uh, thing at the very end, and he got to have that big heroic moment of I'm not going to take this stuff. And I think if I'd like to believe if this movie was made now, the climax would involve them and not him. Yeah, I agree. Uh, I think it's a great twist that Goldie Hawn is part of the club, too. Uh, th- there's lots of Frankenstein references, if you noticed. And wh- another f- favorite line of mine, they're talking about Bruce Willis possibly going to prison. And they said, do you know what they do to soft, bald, overweight Republicans in prison? Um, and the men are all doofuses. Yes. Yeah, they ha- like um, uh, Isabella Rossellini, like she's got some like good looking, like just hunks of meat. And she's just like, get out of here. <laughs> Um, And then there's a line that this is not a dream, this is a nightmare. And I I think that that sums up my feelings about the the living forever. And and especially in this state when your body's decaying, but you have to try to maintain your looks. 
I I love the whole like painting and their skins peeling off and like there's just so many fun things. Um, oh, and then there was that great comedy sequence too of um, when they um, drug his drink and he won't drink it. Oh my god! <laughs> it's, and it keeps spilling, yeah. so like there's hardly any left, and they just keep waiting. The castle at the end, it looks like, um, or it's the mansion or, or something. They're out there for that big meeting. It looks like the castle from The Wizard of Oz. I thought. Um, and then they were showing some famous people who were living forever. There was Elvis, Marilyn, Andy Warhol, James Dean. I don't, did you recognize any other celebrities? Um, no, but I think she was referencing, um, what's her name? Greta, um, Greta Garbo. I think she referenced her, yeah. And then, of course, it ends with them going to his funeral, and then they fall down the stairs into a million pieces. So, uh, yes, I love that. So, yeah, that's the one thing I was nattering on about that I didn't like is that he kind of got his hero's end um, and they don't. But at the same time, if you sort of step back and look at it, it's kind of sweet because they're they're together forever and they're fighting and stuff, but they're still kind of taking care of each other. And I mean, yeah, they they fall over the spray paint because they literally are just spray painting and they look like shit. And of course, you know, they kind of got their comeuppance in a little way, but at the same time, um, they're together and they're friends. So I kind of felt like, um, it, it, the ending, yes, it served him a little too well, but again, I love at the funeral when she just like gives him a raspberry as they're leaving. Cause they're talking about how great he is. And it's just like, fuck you, dude. I, I, yeah, I loved it. Should we rate this movie? Because um, something about fast forwards is that we can't always rate the fast forwards together because not not both of us has seen it. So what should we use as a rating? Oh, my gosh. Oh, my gosh. There's so many things. What about... A candelabra through the I body? I say, a, yeah, can, yeah, something through the stomach, yeah. Uh, how about, yeah, a candelabra. So out of zero to ten, candelabra through the through a stomach. <laughs> how many zero being you hated it, ten being it's a perfect movie. How many do you give? Death becomes her. I give it an eight and a half because it's funny. Um, it's great. That I only have a few little like aches and pains about it, but otherwise, I love it. I I give it an eight. I I wrote down an eight when right after I watched it. I think. It's a commentary on plastic surgery in Hollywood, and it's self-aware, and I think it works. So, funny thing happened. When I mentioned to Lisa what was coming up this week um, to create a drink for, she said that she had already watched it. They just happened to watch it, like, two nights before I told her that. So, Lisa, what did you create for us this week? Hi, horror friends. Lisa here. And today we're going to be making a drink inspired by the film Death Becomes Her, which I like to call Death Bellini's her. All right, for this drink, you are going to need champagne, chambord, blueberries, blackberries, kiwi, a blender, a champagne glass, and a spoon. So, in the ever going quest to stay young, I thought it would be fun to incorporate fruits that are supposed to have anti aging properties. So go ahead and grab maybe 10 blueberries and just a couple blackberries, two or three, and toss those into the blender. You're going to need to peel your kiwi, and then this is a little bit fussy, but go ahead and cut it in half, and then I want you to just cut the green part and try to avoid the seeds, just for the sake of the consistency of the drink. Put all that green kiwi into the blender, and then add about a half ounce of chambord. If it gets sticky, you can add a little more if you need to. Go ahead and puree that until it is as finely chopped down as possible. And once that happens, go ahead and grab your teaspoon and put about two heaping teaspoons at the bottom of your champagne glass. Top with champagne. You may have to give it a little stir because sometimes that just likes to stick together. And voila! We have Death Bellinis here. I hope you enjoy Horror Friends, and we will see you next time. Cheers. All right, it's time for our Fast Forward segment, and since Meg picked the movie, I picked a Fast Forward, and I'm going to talk to you about a movie I just saw recently, which is The Shape of Water. And I still haven't seen it, so what the hell's wrong with me? Well, you know, I hadn't seen it either, and it's like right up our alley. I don't know why we hadn't seen it, and it won Best Picture, so 
Guillermo del Toro. <laughs> did I say that right? Yeah, it, that was good. That you did, you did, you, you got it there. You stuck the landing. <laughs> so, um, he directed this movie, and he won Best Director for it. It is beautiful, nostalgic, but current. It has references to classic Hollywood, classic monsters. There's a lot about communication in it, about, a lot about love. There's um, a, a mute character. There's people of color. There's a homosexual character. And I'm not going to give away any spoilers. I'm just saying all the things that are great about it. And it's a love story. And it's, and it's creepy and scary and, and all of those things. Doug Jones, who played the creature, was just at the convention we were at yesterday. And uh, he, people have brought up, is got his career start, or is famous for being Mac at night, like the big Mac commercials from McDonald's, which is insane. Somebody was cosplaying as, as that guy. But The Shape of Water, I recommend it. I know my mother-in-law hated it. <laughs> Um, and I'm, I don't know why she hated it so much because I wasn't able to talk to her about why she hated it when she saw it uh, because I hadn't seen it yet. But I I thought it was a great movie. I uh, A group of my friends saw it. I didn't get to see it with them. And it was split down the middle. Um, half of them loved it. And it seemed like half of them were like, meh. So I, that makes me curious. And I think I think that's probably a sign of a good movie if um, if – some people just absolutely hate it <laughs> and people love it. Like, I feel like at least no one's down the middle. Something, this isn't a spoiler, but something that I noticed, I watched it a second time. Something that I noticed is that there's a nice commentary on the American dream and nostalgia of what we think is like the perfect American family in quotation marks. And if you don't fit into that, how do you feel about that? And, and I think it's really smart. And isn't it funny that in 2018 that's still pertinent? But I think it's we all still feel pressure to have that, like, nuclear family. So that's interesting. That's very deep, girl. Thank you. So, yeah, I, I recommend it. And also, I showed it to a class of mine, and the class really connected with it and loved it. So you've got more than just my, <laughs> my recommendation. So, Meg, what anything else you want to talk about before we wrap up this week's episode did you guys, i just want to go back did you guys hear that kelly says she showed her class shape of water she's the coolest teacher in the world i wish you were my teacher um I, no i'm just i i'm excited i want to know what people think of death becomes her because i don't know i just love it and i had so much fun watching it like i was like giddy watching it it was just fun and it brought me back to like that nice warm childhood feeling so I just I want I want people to shout out and let us know what they think of it and you know this was one of those times when like you said that warm feeling of rewatching it but I didn't feel like oh but now I have to feel bad about having loved it so much I don't feel bad like I feel like I feel like it holds up it does hold up, and I think that is something that's happened in this experiment of Horror Rewind is a couple times we've been like, oh, are we allowed to like like this still? But, you know, I think sometimes it's important to remember that just because something is problematic now and we can call those things out and we can say, okay, I, I don't think that's appropriate or that's right, it doesn't mean that it wasn't good art at the time and that, you know... It, there's there is an innocence and ignorance sometimes and there's also um a malignancy but sometimes it's okay like you were talking about watching a friend's episode and being like oh wow that's really sexist and so I think it's okay just to look back it's just like anything in life sometimes we know more now than we did then it doesn't make it bad yeah I agree so comment, uh, let us know, or call into our Anchor station. There's a new s format for Anchor, but we can still publish your phone calls. And let us know what you thought about Death Becomes Her. Have a great week, and we'll see you in the horror section.